Snuff Cowan to Phil for November 1944. Dear Phil, I have been trying for some time to settle down so as to let you in on what is new. Well, I guess by the time you get this letter, you will already have received one from Dot. So, by me telling you that she was down here should not be a surprise to you. Well, Phil, it sure was a damn good feeling to see her. It was only a short time that I was away from home, and I missed her like I never thought I could anyone. I now have a faint idea of what you fellows over there must go through. I am in CQ today, and there isn't a damn thing to do. I just finished a letter to Dot, and you were the next one to come out of my little red book. It is about time, isn't it? Do not give me hell, as I know I have not been a good boy, as I have once told you before, it is one hell of a job to sit down and write to anyone. By the time I finish my daily letter to Dot, I haven't the patience to write to anyone else. Enough of this, as maybe I can give you some news. I have been alerted that I am going to Aberdeen, Maryland for a four-week course in diesel motor mechanics. Personally, I don't know the first thing about it, but what the hell, it may be interesting. There is one good point about it, and that is that I have hopes of going home for the weekends. I received a letter from Evie last week, and she tells me that she has not heard from you lately. Again, I hope that you are still in England. If I remember correctly, she said that you were going to see her brother. Have you? If so, how is he? We are in ODs down here as of May 1st. And let me tell you that it is still as hot as the page two devil here. Oh, hell, what's the use of griping? I'll be up north very shortly. We have been having a lot of fun in camp ever since we finished basic training. Let me tell you about a lieutenant we had with us at one time. He asked me how you take an aerial photograph. With an aerial, of course. He liked to have died when he heard that. His old cry was, you ain't listening. Tell him, Sergeant, tell him. He once put another question to me. What is the best way to protect yourself from syphilis? Keep your pecker in your pants, I told him. Well, Phil, so long for now and take care of yourself. As ever, snuff. Evelyn to Philip, November 5th, 1944. Dearest Phil, I didn't write yesterday as I went out to see Dot. I did have three gorgeous letters from you, sweetheart, all of which dealt mostly with your plans upon our reunion. Since you see fit to go into detail, I'm going to go to a lot of trouble and give you a lot of details about things I've been wanting to tell you for a long, long time. Your letters were those of the 16th, 17th, and 20th October. As for my reaction, at the present time, all I can say to the whole setup is a very definite no. Phil, I detected a million flaws in the idea not that I wouldn't be willing to try it, but there are very many things to consider which you neglected completely. Do you for one minute think I would sleep in boarding houses with Adele? It isn't like it was before, and it never will be that way again until Adele is a grown young woman. Your life is not your own when you have a child, and while this applies more to me than you, 
you are nevertheless more tied down than previously. I like the idea of going into business, but I don't want to go into business immediately upon your return. I'm sure you realize that when you have your own business, you must devote double the time you would to an ordinary job. And I don't particularly care for the idea of being tied down more than necessary when you first return. It's really very difficult to even plan, though it does make interesting conversation and gives us something to look forward to. When I mentioned the idea to the moms, they both disliked it intensely. Mom, yours, doesn't think Jack Nirenberg would make a good partner, and she isn't too crazy about Jack anyway. However, and of great importance is this, you evidently do not wish to live at 4906 when you return. That is the conclusion my mother drew. For a long time now, my mother has been urging me to give up the house and return home. She would only charge me a small amount for caring for Adele and my board, say 12 to $15 per week, and I would have my entire allotment check, plus a good portion of my salary to myself, plus your bond. In that way, we could really save a lot of money, and I wouldn't have to break my neck for it. I want you to answer me yes or no as to whether I should give up the house and go home, and I shall await your reply before saying or doing anything. Of course, there are many other reasons why my mother is dissatisfied. She claims that this house was ours and not the strongman's, who have every benefit mentionable but refuse to cooperate in the matter of in the matter of caring for or even having anything to do with the house. My mother cannot understand why I must go to work and come home and clean a house. For whom? Phil, I worked very hard and I know it is not it was not appreciated. I once had an argument with your mom and she claimed that she and Harry are doing my mother a favor by staying here. Her words were, we're paying for what we're getting. That my mom is not losing anything. Phil, do you realize that if my mother either rented or sold this house, she'd have a good income which would enable her to stop working as hard as she has been working? She doesn't make a cent on this place, and many is the time mom gets a little peeved because she won't fix certain things. My mom could make $1,500 profit on this place if she sold it today, or else she could get $50 or even more if she rented it. Betty is paying $60 for her place. And I've also learned that a daughter's mother is not like a son's mother. No, Phil, there is a world of difference, and it makes me very happy that I have a daughter for that very reason. Phil, do you recall that argument we had when we went to Columbus, that Mom did not wish to help me with Adele? Well, it's worse now than it ever was. She loves to play with the kid and will help me with her, but God forbid if I have to leave her with Adele and go away. She tells me to get my mother to care for Adele, and she even tells me that I don't appreciate what my mother is doing for me. She never makes me feel like my mother does when I leave in the evening to go out. She doesn't mind if Adele is sleeping, and even then she always says I hope she doesn't wake up and be troublesome. Sometimes I say to myself, I'm going out and the hell with what happens, and that's the only way I get out. I'm, um, you know, as well as I do, that I would never, never take advantage of your mother. In fact, no one of her daughter-in-laws has done as much for her as I did. But just as she claims I do not appreciate anything, neither does she. Everything is coming to the strongest, or so they think. I hate to hurt you in any way, and you know that full well, Phil, but one of the sentences in your letter hurt very deeply. You said that I would never have page two 
to suffer privation in any shape or form being your wife. I hope not anymore, for I feel that I, I've had more than my share of it already. Furthermore, Adele is like a caged bird in her own house. She mustn't dare go here or touch that, and I can't leave her alone for a minute when she's in our home for fear that she'll get on either Harry's or Goldie's nerves. I'm tickled to death that she can run freely at my mother's. Besides, the porch is so taken up with Diana's carriage, miniature crib, and playpen that the kid hasn't anywhere to play. Half of Adele's things are at my mother's and half here, and it is most inconvenient. Phil, since the day Goldie married Harry and moved into this house, she has never once lifted a finger to aid in the cleaning of it. She helps in the kitchen with the dishes, and many was the time that Harry thought that was too much for her. I once casually mentioned to Mom that it would be so much easier on the both of us if we had a little cooperation. But she said she wouldn't say anything to Goldie for fear of hurting her feelings. Your mom is always so considerate of someone else's feelings, except mine. I once told her that she sticks with her other children more than she sticks with me, and she said that I hurt her more than they did. When I asked her why, she said I told her she was short and didn't want to walk beside her. Well, I was shocked. The last time Gloria was here, she kidded the ears off Mom because she is such a shorty. And all I did was look at Mom. Phil, way down deep in my heart, I don't think Mom ever wanted me to be your wife. I know it's a pretty awful thing to say, but many is the time I felt that way, even when you were home. And since I'm anxious to get it off my chest, you have it for once and for all. It sort of reminds me of the fuss Mom made when Gloria and Jack got married. It's only natural that there is, a vast, there is vast differences and inconveniences when so many people live together in a house with two small children. We've all gotten along pretty nicely considering and have managed that way because we keep out of each other's way. For instance, Goldie bathes Diana first thing in the morning. I'll be in my bedroom with Adele and she'll suddenly have to go. I must go down two flights of steps with her to the cellar and hold her on the seat so she can make and trudge up two flights of steps. When I get back up there, I'm fairly well exhausted. All of it is just small things, things that you stand for day in and day out until you'll think until you think you're just about bust. My only consolation for this whole mess is the fact that we can save a little money and look forward to better days. Your mom has said many things to my mother that have hurt her deeply too. For instance, when Diana was born, she said that my Goldie doesn't have anyone to wash her baby's clothes or do this for her or that for her. Goldie only has the diaper service to help her out. My mother is broken hearted because she has to be of such a help to me when in all right it should be my husband's responsibility. Harry can't understand why I'm hard hit by the war because my mother helps me out. I think they are all a little jealous if anything. My mother didn't do much for me when I was home, and I shopped and cleaned the house, this house beside. At that time, Harry used to boil up because I didn't do most of the shopping, and he had to go to the grocery. Now Goldie doesn't even have time to shop. I realize that Harry says many things he doesn't really mean. In fact, most everyone does, but I can see that no one else gives a good goddamn about you. When you're so down and out that you must have help, well, then you get a little consideration. I'm glad that you reassured me that we will live alone someday, and I only pray that someday is soon. I'm not anxious to go back to my mother's place either.
though it will be much easier for me. My mom says I'm worn out and need a rest and that living with her will make it easier for us all around. My job is a regular cinch for I am seldom tired when I get home. Even my dad's job is a cinch. Of course, we have our busy days, but on the whole, both jobs are very nice. But taking care of cleaning and many other duties of a house isn't necessary for me, and she can't see why I should. Harry claims it's harder on Mom since I went to work. Mom washes the porch floor once a week, sweeps the front, washes the kitchen and bathroom floors twice a week, and cleans her room once a week. I take care of page three, my room, hall, living room, and dining room on my day off. This place is always so filthy looking that it turns my stomach. I usually only find time when I have a day off to clean, and during that time, this place could pile six inches high with dust but it waits till I remove it. I don't expect anyone to clean my house for me, but I do believe in cooperation. If you want me to stay here, and we will live here after the war, all right, but I doubt if my mother will continue to allow us the $35 rate. If you and I lived here, she'd even lower the rate, but she will per not, not permit it any longer. I've not said a word of any of this to the family, and I wish everything I've said in this letter to be kept strictly between us and never to be aired before any of the family. I've held my speech for a long time now in the hope that we would soon be reunited, and when all of us lived apart, we'd all be good friends, and as any nasty speeches would only make hard feelings and there is no need for that. It's only a matter of time, and I think I can take it that much longer if I must. You once said that I become annoyed with more little things than you do. I don't think so, Phil, for you are under very similar conditions in the Army. You can't do whatever you like when you like, and so you hate it. There are many other things I could tell you, but I'm just not in the mood for any more of this. Just think it over and let me know what to do. I'll naturally abide by your word as I feel the decision is yours. You may feel differently, and that's what I want to know. Mickey Wyman has not been feeling well for a long time. Nothing serious, but she always seems to be ailing with this or that and her doctor suggested that she go to the hospital for one week for observation, and perhaps they could put their finger on what is the matter with her. She's always having trouble with her stomach, headaches, dizziness, and the like, and is rather disgusted. So today she's going to Jewish for a week, as the doctor suggested. Mom went over to their house this morning alone so she could say so long to Mickey. Mom received a bracelet and necklace set from Jack, just like the one Gloria has. Since the necklace is a little long, she's having two of the pebble-like shells removed and will have earrings made. I worked my usual four hours yesterday and came straight home as Mom had telephoned the office to inform me that at long last there was some mail. I had some lunch, stayed out with Adele, who did not nap yesterday and was very cranky, gave her dinner, she ate just a drop, bathed her and put her to bed. I then took something to eat myself. Mom went to see Dragon Seed last night, washed some clothes and left for dots. I was very tired but decided to go anyway. I left her house fairly early and walked home from Broad Street so you needn't worry about my going alone. I detest going alone, but I have no one to go with me. Faye does not like Dot. She would go with me. I wore my new lumberjack dress, and it is really a gorgeous outfit. Betty and Mrs. Feldman raved about it, and Dot said that she must get a lumberjack dress. Once out on 60th Street, 
I bought Lil a pair of pajamas in exchange for the nightie mom gave her, which was too large. And then to Dot's. Dot and I chatted a while, and then she showed me some bath mats she had made while down south. Phil, those mats were lovely, and just as soon as I have a little more time and some spare cash, I'm going to make several. Dot looks grand, having gained eight pounds, while with snuff. The trip cost her $300, but she said it was worth every penny for a most important reason. She said she and Snuff have never gotten along sexually, as you will recall my telling you, but that her stay with him changed both of them completely, and for the first time since they were married, they were compatible. Can you beat that? After chatting a while, we took a walk on 60th Street, and I wanted to shop, or rather window shop, for a dress. It subsequently developed that Dot took me to a place where she always buys her clothes, and I wound up buying another dress. How's that for action? Two dresses in three days. Not bad at all. The new dress cost ten ninety five and fifty cents for a zipper. It is plain, yet very dressy. It's very... Page four, different from most dresses I've had. It's a wool dress of the palest sh shade, if there is such a word, of lemon yellow I've ever seen. It has no collar, just a plain round neck with three large buttons of the same color to button the top part of the dress. It has three-quarter sleeves, which I detest, but almost all dresses have them. And the edges of the sleeves are trimmed with a bit of ruching of the same color, pale yellow, pale lemon yellow. At the shoulders, only in the front, along the sleeve, is a large tuck that gives fullness across the bust. It has a fitted waist and a large gathered skirt and has slash pockets on either side of the skirts, trimmed with the same ruching that is on the sleeves. It's the first dress I've ever had that really requires a necklace, and I'm hoping my moonstones will look well. However, this dress would look best with a pin and earring set of aqua stones, and I mean to get it just as soon as I can. I also need black shoes and bag and hat and gloves to set off both my new dresses. But that will also have to wait for a little while. Gee, but I wish you could see how I look in them. I gave a deposit on the dress and Dot is going to pick it up for me when it is ready. So much for that. In your letters you asked me to discontinue buying bonds and built up a cash reserve at the bank. I was figuring on doing that myself starting January 1st, 1945. I'll buy one more $50 bond with my December check, and then I'll merely deposit the balance of the check to our account. As I told you in the previous letter, we now have $1,100 in bonds. I also have $675 towards another bond in 25 cent stamps and hope to finish it also in December. If that is the case, we shall add another $100 in bonds to our original total next month, and then I'll stop buying bonds. Since you are investing your money in bonds, and since we already have a goodly amount of them, I too feel it would be better to save at the bank. Our bank, amount incident, bank account incidentally totals $185. So you see, sweet, we have attained a little more than $1,000 in cash. That's enough to get us off to a fairly good start on most any enterprise, don't you think? I asked Mom how Harry made out in his first day at the station yesterday, and she said fairly well. She doesn't think he'll make a lot of money right now. Since gas is scarce, but as time goes on and he is able to sell tires, antifreeze, and the like, he should be able to make out very well. He likes the work 
and he particularly likes being his own boss. And that is just about all I'm going to say today. I think I've said more than enough already. Just one more thing. If I should go back to my mother's, she would give me the front room. When the war is over, and in the event all of the boys come home at the same time, we would have the front room, the boys would have a room, and my mother and dad would have a room. Ruth would be put out for a little while, but I'm sure we could manage. It would naturally take a little while till we decided what we were going to do and where we were going to live. However, I'm leaving the entire decision up to you. I think you think things out more completely than I do, though I, woman, doesn't look at things a lot differently. But I feel you know enough about the situation to decide our future. I haven't any complaints whatever concerning how the folks have treated me. They have been as good to me as anyone would be considering our relationship, and I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. I guess they mean well in their own peculiar sort of way. In spite of all I've said, I always want to be good friends with all, but I want to live alone and be friends if you don't mind. You asked me to send along your civilian shoes. I have two pairs of brown shoes. One pair has little dots all over them, recall, and they aren't too badly beat. If you would like to have them, or just one pair, kindly let me know. I think the fancier pair is in better condition. Dot's sister Naomi told me that a fellow from the ground crew of the 8th Air Force got a 30 days furlough home. Have you ever heard of such furloughs for men in the ground crew? I rushed through this letter so quickly that I have many typographical errors. Pardon, please. Page 5. I got to bed very late last night. When I got home, I found Adele had wet the bed, which necessitated a complete change. By the time I had washed, undressed, and got into bed, it was darn close to 2 o'clock. I arose fairly early this morning and felt tired all day. I cleaned our room thoroughly and just used the electric sweeper on the rugs downstairs. I had Adele out for an hour and a half this morning and chased after her till I felt worn out. I typed most of this while she slept and I'm going to get to bed as early as possible this evening. When Ethel took Mickey up to the Jewish hospital this afternoon, she met Matt and Lena. Etta is laboring at the present time, so I ought to have some good news for you most any hour. Looks like Etta and Mickey will be keeping each other company. I'm afraid Etta is going to have a terrible time of it as she was positively enormous, and I think the baby will be too large for her. We'll know all soon enough. And now, baby, I'm going to call it quits for the day. I guess I don't have to tell you that I adore you, that I love you and miss you so much. I just don't know what to do with myself. I can think of just one more thing. Dot and I had banana splits at the ice cream parlor on 60th Street, that we visited frequently when we lived at 59th and Chestnut. It used to be Sid's, and now it is something else. Dot and I sat in the same booth we usually chose, and just remembering made me kind of sick in the stomach. It's a funny way to remember things, but that's how I get. I never used to, but this long, drawn-out business affects one queerly. Today, baby, marks our 15th month. No, sweet. We'll never, ever be separated, really, for sometimes you are so very close I could almost reach out and touch you. It hurts so much. I want to take you into my arms and to love you. Your Ev. Gloria Strong and Phil's sister-in-law to Phil, Sunday, November 5th, 1944. Dear Phil, here goes our Alibi Glow, 
with the same old story of having men to write and send these pictures to you sooner. However, I do believe you're the correspondence lagger now, though. At any rate, I gather you're quite busy, so let's not quibble. Say, who started this anyway? Page 2. As you can see from the snaps, your daughter gets cuter as well as bigger all the time. Your wife is not getting bigger, but as you can see, looks lovely as ever. Too bad the snaps weren't technicolor, as the red is quite becoming to Glamour Jr. The picture of yours truly kindly disregard. Didn't want to ship a snap with Cutie Pie Adele Barra in it, though. I hear your APO number has been changed. Unfortunately, I can't find the letter in which H3 Ev told me this fact. Here's hope this letter will reach you anyway. How are you doing? And what are you doing? Your middle brother Jack is quite busy, but is expecting a furlough next spring. As I gather you know by now from Ev, a gal who doesn't let grass grow under her feet. Don't think I've forgotten my promise to send you a box of Hershey bars. I wished to tell I've given up hope. My girlfriend in the wholesale drug concern says they're not getting them anymore. They're all going overseas to the page four boys, so they say. Soon we'll have to be sending requests to you to send us poor civilians some chocolate bars. I did send a four pound box of chocolates from Lofts in September, which I hope you received in good condition. I'm becoming quite busy myself. I have gone back to college twice weekly, taking English and bio, getting educated in my old age, you see, or probably don't from this letter. So long, Phil. Let me hear from you if you get a moment. Take good care of yourself. Be good. Love, Gloria.